And so I was going home that night, and I said, wow, we lost the Xerxes boot. We could make that our symbol, X for extinction, X for Xerxes, X for a butterfly shape. And so December 9th, 1971, on that train from London back to to Huntingdon, the uh, Xerxes Society was, was hatched. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Yadrick, and this is Tree Hugger Podcast, the show where we talk about what extinction and emergence has to do with ecological restoration. Welcome to winter if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. We are settling into prime storytelling time this season. It is sporadically cold and rainy here where I live, so it's kind of odd to be talking about butterflies since I haven't seen one in months. But there are butterflies flying somewhere, so it's a go time for this show with Dr. Robert Michael Pyle. Bob is a biologist and writer who has worked in conservation biology around the world. This episode is just a portion of a fairly long phone conversation we had a while back. Here we talk mostly about conservation of butterflies and restoration of their habitats. We particularly discuss blue butterflies like the Xerces and the Palos Verdes varieties. Dr. Pyle lives, writes, and studies natural history in rural southwest Washington. Bob has published 24 books, including Wintergreen, Where Bigfoot Walks, Mariposa Road, four collections of poetry, the novel Magdalena Mountain, and a flight of butterfly books. In honor of the now-extinct Xerces Blue Butterfly, Bob founded the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation in the Butterfly's Honor. Xerces Blue Butterflies disappeared from our observation in the early 1940s. The Xerces was a small, brightly colored butterfly characterized by iridescent blue on the upper wing surfaces of males and pale spots below. Originally described in 1852, it was endemic to and once locally common in the coastal sand dunes of the upper San Francisco Peninsula, including sites now within the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. It is one of the first American butterflies to become extinct from habitat loss caused by urban development, among some other things that I'll talk about. I wish Western science had more than 90-ish years to get to know the Xerxes. It takes more than nectar to entice butterflies to take up residence. While nectar-rich flowers attract drifters to stop and feed, host plants send an invitation to stay a while. Larval host plants are the secret to successful butterfly tending. They are plants required by a caterpillar for growth and development. The Xerces preferred stabilized sandy sites where its low-growing larval host plant occurred. Along with the butterfly, yellow bush lupin and deerweed, some of its favorite plants became jeopardized as well. To find out a little bit more information about these plants beyond what the butterfly used, you can look at that Native American ethnobotany database, which generally lists multiple uses of just about any plant you can imagine. So for a nectarine plant used by the Palos Verdes blue butterfly, Lotus scoparius, which I am intimately familiar, indigenous peoples use this plant for decoction of foliage for coughs, food for livestock, fiber for building materials, for house construction, and roots for soap. So just for those handful of uses used by peoples, We can imagine that there was hundreds of years worth of tending by people, notwithstanding the uses by wildlife. You might be more familiar with the preferred plants for monarch butterflies. Milkweeds would have occupied small clearings in the forest in the portions of Turtle Island lying east of us here. First peoples used common milkweed for food and likely increased its abundance. Then European settlers cleared forests and native prairies and reworked the landscape into a patchwork quilt of small farms where quote-unquote weeds, such as common milkweed, readily grew in margins along fences and between crop rows. My point is that people helped shape the environment through their relationship with the plants for thousands of years. 
Little doubt that initial clearing of and land use changes over the last couple of centuries greatly aided the expansion of host and nectar plants, leading to what European and settler colonizers perceived as an overinflated abundance of butterflies during this snapshot in time of ecological study. Then, as Dina Gillia Whitaker explains in her book, As Long as Grass Grows, while forced removal of indigenous communities is often portrayed as limited to early American and pre-American history, numerous other removal events and modes of indigenous displacement occurred as a result of federal policy and deserve examinations for the ways they constitute environmental and cultural disruption. So well after the Indian Wars, the legacy of loss continued with the imposition of a policy of assimilation and the systemic forced removal of children from their families during the boarding school era, which was like roughly 1887 to 1934, what's been called the second of four removals. This legacy cannot be overstated and a growing awareness of intergenerational and historical trauma recognizes the social and psychological implications that histories of genocide and colonialism have had on indigenous populations. So what I'm really saying here is that in conjunction with urbanization, the removal of these historic human activities really led to the downfall of this species that we refer to as the Xerces blue butterfly. Liam O'Brien, a San Francisco-based lepidopterist, writes that by 1919, the Xerces was restricted primarily to a single locality near Lobos Creek and its surrounding dunes within the Presidio boundaries. It was reaching a tipping point even though in the 1930s some Xerces fans tried unsuccessfully to relocate some individuals to quote-unquote more suitable sites where they could establish and disperse. Butterfly relocation or assisted migration is a sort of common strategy at invertebrate conservation and restoration. And this is something that's been proposed by Bob and many others for some sort of rewilding associated with the butterfly. This brings us up to the current era where we entertain the proposal of rewilding the Xerces blue from extinction. Anyway, I don't want to get too far ahead of Bob's story. Listen through and I have some additional thoughts on the proposal to rewild the butterfly from extinction. My sincerest thanks go out to Jim Roysden from Tampa, Florida. Like absolutely most episodes on Triagra Podcast, I had some audio adventure to navigate this conversation with Bob. We recorded the audio over the phone using Google Voice, and the sound quality came out fairly low. I reached out to the awesome podcast movement community, and Jim stepped up to help. He is creator and host of the Innovator Club Podcast, a show focused on creative thinking and innovation. Jim massaged the audio file a bit and I learned a couple new audio lessons in the process. It was a bit of a bear to edit, so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Robert Michael Pyle. This Got call you. is now being recorded. All right. Dr. Robert Michael Pyle, welcome to Tree Hugger Podcast. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here, Michael. <laughs> Good to hear from you. Thanks for calling. Sure. I don't know if you... Remember me. We met once before. I already knew that you were the kind person who took me all around Palos Verdes and taught me a lot of things, took me into the labs, introduced me to some people, including that cool security guard. And, and um, yeah, no, that was a very special day in my book. And then later in the afternoon, we went off to see some uh, El Segundo sites, didn't we? But we did. I mean, uh, yeah, we went to the, the site that Trump owned and, and uh, walked around that. And then we went to the... Uh, <laughs> We finished off with a beer together in um, that little brew pub in what was the little town we were in? In Redondo Beach. Redondo Beach, of course. I remember that day very well. Yep. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. I, I've never seen the uh, Mariposa Road in which I write that day up. You're in that book. Yeah, thank you. I got a little cameo. That's pretty cool. And yeah. I just I was trying to track my memory and trying to think of the year because – at that point in time, I was working down in you know Southern California at the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy, working on habitat restoration yes. related to the Palos Verdes blue butterfly. And it's cool that you remember the security guard, Sam. Uh, he was Sam. a neat guy. Yeah, he's incredible. And uh, Sam, good folks all around. I couldn't remember if we went to the golf course. 
had to have some public access, and we went there and took advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. So the way I remember it, because I knew this is like pre-social media days. So That's right. I, well, I don't is, know, I don't know how I knew you were like kind of maybe coming, but you rolled up into this very secure Navy facility, you know, with a gate and a guard. And I do remember we were in the at the greenhouse at the nursery. I was pretty sure I knew who you were when you rolled up, but then I was like kind of flabbergasted that you negotiated your way past the, into the well, into the facility. Much as I was, I was astonished with my uh, my beard and my little uh, my little old Honda. I was amazed that I got into that place. <laughs> But you look like you belong, right? <laughs> you're like you're like I'm yeah, a so. I'm a butterfly expert, and I'm going to see the butterfly. Gotta put on that shtick, you know. I really am a butterfly scientist. So. <laughs> you are. I had a rather nice business card printed up for that year with my my story of what I was doing and so on. That got me into a remarkable number of places that that I would not normally have had easy access to. 2008, I had many, many encounters with law enforcement that year at every different level of people who wondered what the heck I was doing in some of the places I was with a, with a butterfly net, but it all worked out okay. So I don't know how uh, if many people know about it, but you did write a book about it. I would encourage folks to look it up. The the entire enterprise was the first ever butterfly big year. Now, the big year is something that birders have done a lot. There have been several books and even a popular movie starring Steve Martin and Jack Black acting as bird watchers uh, called The Big Year, in which competitive birders try to see how many species they can tick in one year. But nobody had ever done that with butterflies. And I wasn't interested in being competitive, and there's nobody to compete with because I was the only one. But I did it as a butterfly a thon to raise money for the Xerxes Society and its habitat programs. So people pledged money per species that I would definitely see. But my main purpose well, I had three, really. That was one. One of them was that I wanted to have a basis for a grand adventure, a real field trip all over the country. And I did. I traveled the country for an entire year for 80-some thousand miles, and I saw so many habitats, so many places and people. But the third thing, Michael, that was most important to me was I was trying to get a kind of a contemporary transect of how butterflies were doing. I've been involved in butterfly conservation for over half a century, 66, 60. That's when I got involved in it. It really kind of was one of the very few people that got it going in this country. And uh, I wanted to see this. How are we doing with butterfly conservation all around the country? And that was one of the main reasons I did it. So I did this adventure and I wrote the book called Mariposa Road, which means, of course, Butterfly Road. And I urged people to come along with me on that field trip because it was one heck of a year-long field trip. And visiting with you that day, Michael, at Palace Fair Days, it was really one of my highlight days. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. We, we never saw the Palace Fair Days blue, but we had a darn good time. I know. Unfortunately, there's not too many of them, and they just pop out for such a short period of time. Right. And, um, yeah, I think we might have missed them by, like, oh, I'll, maybe I'll give you a, a good buffer period. It was like, several weeks. <laughs> so, I think so, too. I yeah, it, was, it wasn't just days. It wasn't like you just nearly missed them, but, it, yeah, it was a few weeks. I thought um, when we got it was going to be too dry, too late. saw some Akmon Blues and some other things, but... Uh, but seeing the habitat and seeing the management and getting the lowdown on it, as well as on El Segundo Blue from you, that was valuable. I'd like your your take or if you have any lessons learned or some impressions from butterfly-type restoration projects that you've seen. As the founder of Xerces, you, I feel like you may have encountered a few. The Xerces Society is named for the extinct Xerces Blue. Now, it all came about because I was lucky as a young butterfly conservationist. I'd been a, a uh, student activist uh, at the University of Washington. We were inspired by uh, Berkeley, of course. Everything started at Berkeley and then moved up to Seattle, inspired to start an ecology action group at uh, UW. So I'd been schooled in that. I wanted to pursue the whole question of butterfly and, and uh, invertebrate conservation. There was only one place in the world to do that, which I was aware, and that was... Uh, a laboratory in England called the Monkswood Experimental Station, where some eight or ten scientists, all of whom did research on rare butterflies and other insects, were were all based working on ecological research that was designed to uh, inform the management and the restoration of habitats around around England. And this was the only place in the world this was going on for for butterflies then. So I was lucky enough to get a Fulbright scholarship to 
study there for a full year. I did so with a remarkable group of mentors, John Heath and Jack Dempster and Mike Morris and Eric Duffy and people who had been involved in the restoration of the large copper butterfly to England after its extinction in the 1860s. They brought it back from Germany and then Holland, and that one didn't really work out ultimately because it became a homozygote. Uh, virtually a clone and lost any uh, kind of genetic diversity it needed to adapt. But they learned from that. So while I was there, I was learning about the uh, the way they had successfully, Jeremy Thomas had successfully managed to restore the large or the uh, black hair streak and the brown hair streak by learning exactly what they needed, their autecology as it's called. And the same with the swallowtail butterfly on the Norfolk uh, fens that uh, Jack Dempster was working on. They were getting the technique down, but they had their toughest challenge with a butterfly called the Large Blue. That butterfly had been doing its best to try to become extinct for half a century, and they didn't know why. And they, they kept protecting it and setting aside reserves, and it wasn't working out. And it kept dropping out. Finally, Jeremy Thomas took it in hand and did the research and figured figured out exactly what it needed, and they were able to manage the grasslands for it. It feeds on, it has the weirdest life history, Michael. The, uh, you know, of course, Palos Verdes Blue and other rare blues have uh, commensal relations or mutualistic relations with ants. And the ants tend to larvae and, and uh, protect them from invertebrate predators, and the larvae exude honeydew as a reward for the ants, just as with aphids. But in the case of the large blue and its genus in Eurasia, it goes much farther in that the, uh, the larvae of the blues feed on wild thyme, and then they drop to the ground, and ants pick them up and take them into the ant nest, and they become carnivorous on the ants. And the ants sort of tolerate their... They're harvesting their own ant brood in exchange for the honeydew. And ultimately, the butterflies pupate underground and emerge underground and crawl up using pheromones that that uh, defuse the attack pheromones of the ants. It's all an incredibly complicated mechanism, and it all works. Or it worked until management changed in England with myxomatosis in the rabbits and uh, stopping the burning uh, so the gorse got too thick and various other things so that uh, removing sheep from the downlands. So the grass changed, the turf changed, and with it, the species of dominant ant changed, and the ant that became dominant would eat the larvae instead of taking them into the nest. So um, it was all falling apart, and the butterfly was about to become extinct. And I went to a lecture that winter in England, uh, in London, where I heard it said, if we lose the large blue, let's make that a symbol so that we don't lose any more British butterflies. And I, on the train home that night, I said to myself, wow, I was kind of depressed because I didn't know what I was going to do back home with everything I was learning. And it occurred to me, wow. We already lost the Xerxes blue, which became extinct in San Francisco in 1943. It had been declining ever since 1875 or earlier because of changes to uh, the dune habitats around San Francisco. Even in 1875, Herman Baer wrote to Herman Strecker, two different American lepidopters. He said, between the Irish chickens and German hogs, San Francisco is becoming fit place for no insect but louse or flea. <laughs> we're losing the Thursday's blue. That was 1875, and they finally lost it in 1943. And so I was going home that night, and I said, wow, we lost the Xerxes blue. We could make that our symbol, X for extinction, X for Xerxes, X for a butterfly shape. And so December 9th, 1971, on that train from London back to, to Huntingdon, the uh, Xerxes Society was was hatched. And one of our first projects a couple of years later when I was running it out of uh, Yale University where Charles Remington became our sort of godfather for the group while I was doing my, my doctorate with him on butterfly conservation ecology, I was trying to get Xerxes up and running. And one of the very first projects on the El Segundo Blue, which at that time we were working on the habitat that uh, Chevron owned, I think still does, down near Santa Monica. And also, this is before the the whole big airport thing with Santa Monica, the L.A. airport uh, and the El Segundo Blue that got going, involving the Lepidopter's Rudy Matoni, who's the guy who ultimately yeah. rediscovered the Los Verdes Blue and uh, was involved
involved in El Segundo there at Redondo Beach, which brings us back to our day together in the field through that whole round story. <laughs> <laughs> it all loops back around. That's yes, a great does. story. Yeah, and it is interesting. Like you talked about, you know, we figure you figured out like what the what the butterflies needed, and a lot of times I do distinctly remember the Palisberries Blue was redis- rediscovered essentially off this Navy fuel supply depot in San Pedro, California, and that's where we kind of ran our operation. And there was you know patches of habitat there, and they would they would reemerge there, and they were very present there, but problem was or the challenge was to get them to populate other areas of the peninsula right where they historically where their historical range was and you know rains you know california depend you know the restoration i do now is very different because down there it's like one year there was two inches of rain (laughs) you know and then like one other year the next year there was like 12 inches of rain and it was just like the weed it was like, out of, in an after shower, yeah, you know. Yeah, out of out of control. Like the weeds are out of control and it would um yeah. and we did take to a certain extent because like kind of traditional conservation, we you know, we set aside these areas as preserves and we remove some of those either light or heavy disturbance impacts and of which in this case the butterflies are used to right and synchronized with their life cycle so i do remember at one point one point in time we were there we were doing some maintenance the crews were out there doing some maintenance work in this one little patch where the the host plant so the lotus and the astragalus were and I remember the commander, the Navy commander, and he would sit in on these quarterly meetings with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and some of the other consultants, like Travis Longcore, who I um, who I interviewed a, while, a couple of months ago, who was on the oh, show cool. too. Yeah, we'd sit there in these meetings and discuss like the recovery of the butterfly. And I remember I never really interacted with the commander at all, and I was kind of intimidated by him, really. <laughs> and so I never interacted with with him at all, otherwise. But I remember one day he wa- he he like came up the road, he drove up or walked up the road and he was just sort of staring, uh, you know, looking at what we were doing. And he started talking about disturbance ecology with me and just trying to like spitball with me or freestyle with me different tactics we could use to actually kind of stimulate some sort of disturbance, which I think sometimes these plants need, like the lotus and the astragalus, they're kind of quote unquote weeds, right? So, um, and I was just kind of impressed. Well, it's kind of a gasp for a bit, but then because he um, kind of described some crude tactics and they was like, oh, maybe we could try that, maybe. But I'm not sure if we can do that on Habitat for an Endangered Butterfly at all. I was also impressed by just like his uh, perspective of how we could kind of manipulate the landscape for the benefit of the butterfly. That's marvelous. You know, our friends come in strange places, and and it has not infrequently, actually, with butterflies, been the military. So you asked me earlier about how sort of my impressions are about butterfly restoration and and so on around the country. Well, there are n number of examples, but just a couple of them fit right in with that. For example, one of the most successful um, uh, restorations lately has been with the Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly in Western Washington, located most of between where you are in Tacoma and where I am in, in Astoria. There is an area of glacial outwash prairies south of Olympia around the town of Tenino, uh, the famous Mima Mounds and others, and then other, other post-glacial prairies on the wet west side that people don't expect to have, you know, grasslands on the western side of Washington. But most of them have been disturbed for or actually replaced by golf courses or towns or malls or whatever. So there's been quite an effort, as you know, to restore the Puget Prairies and rescue what's left in recent years. And the most successful example of that for the uh, federally endangered Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly and a couple of others has been on joint Fort Lewis McCord, south of Tacoma, where military armament procedures has been fairly important in the disruption of ground that was succeeding to uh, a different kind of vegetation. Of course, it takes care. It is a blunt, you're right, it's a very blunt instrument, there's no question, when you blow up bombs or grenades or something. But if it's managed properly, it can actually be done to the advantage of the kinds of plants the butterflies require. So that butterfly is actually doing much better. It's still got a long way to go to be restored to its former range. 
but on the um, the big army forge, at least uh, the butterfly is doing pretty well in concert with with the uh, military training processor. You look at other examples around the country, and there are some very good ones. The Fender is blue, for example, another uh, West Side Prairie butterfly, but one in Oregon in the Willamette Valley, uh, kind of the echo of the Puget Prairies in Washington, but. Uh, those prairies were created under volcanic rather than glacial influences in Oregon, south of the Columbia. And uh, a butterfly and its food plant, both thought to be extinct, were rediscovered there. The Fender's blue and the Kincaid's lupin. A lot of the endangered blues, people wonder why, we're, why these are blues. Well, a lot of the blue butterflies, some of them are very common, but other species of blue butterflies have this coexistence with uh, ants that we talked about earlier, and their lifestyles are quite complicated. And so in order for them to uh, to thrive, uh, they uh, require the ants in good shape and them. And sometimes that does require different forms of disturbance. And so the blues, with these complicated lifestyles, become qualifiers for endangerment. And so that's that's the kind of example that, that we look at, too. And then there are lots of others. The the Oregon silver spot on the coast isn't doing so very well yet in its restoration because it's hard to get the violets it requires to grow in the right kind of numbers and with the succession of plants along the coast. Um, but they're coming up with new methods of growing violets in, in sort of carpets that they lay out on the habitat that may work. There are any number of conservation biology tools and tricks that are being used with butterflies all over the country right now. And there are some pretty spectacular recoveries and some that we're really very, very worried about. For example, the, of course, the monarchs, have, they're doing a little bit better in the east now, but they've truly crashed in the west. So it's a whole panoply of problems and opportunities. That's right. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned a joint base, Lewis McCord, because, yeah, living in Tacoma, we're definitely you know, partially a military town and there's lots of lots of folks who go there for work and are, you know, part of the military. Actually we have some pretty close friends. My running buddy actually is a is a commander of an artillery regiment and that or You're artillery really, an artillery brigade with all these commanders, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a captain of an artillery brigade and uh, wow. we do talk about to a great extent, I don't know if he's totally an open book, but he tells me a bit about you know, how they operate, even out here and then out Yak in Yakima as well. Yeah, and I work with some contractors as well that end up um, out there seasonally, you know, planting like sage scrub. But is your running mate, uh, is he uh, is he aware of the fact that he's performing butterfly conservation when he's <laughs> commanding his artillery brigade? I don't think so. I think it's one of these things <laughs> like, I don't know if he's intricately involved. I think it's something with his, uh, the higher ups that are involved with some of the negotiations or whatnot, but they definitely, there's some uh, some operational awareness, I would say, on both sides <laughs> as Good. far as like oh. who who's in the, you know, who's in the training zones when. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, all yeah. that sort of thing. Well, I have to tell you that this this whole window on, on the world the butterflies have provided me for, for most of my life and particularly attention to their conservation has come around to some pretty exciting things at this point. And one of them is, the actual possibility of the restoration of the Xerxes blue going on right now. I talked about the English large blue and how they were concerned that if they lost it, it should become a symbol. And that's exactly what happened. Jeremy Thomas, who had been a grad student along with me at Monk's Wood back in the 70s, later became the uh, Hope Professor of Ecology at Oxford University, which is the top ecological job in, in Britain. Um, through his, uh, and he also got an OBE from the Queen for his work on butterfly conservation. Well, he figured out what really had to be done for those blues, and they did it, and they got the habitat back in shape. But then they had a series of bad summers, that is to say, cold and wet, and the large blue butterfly became extinct virtually in their hands. The very last uh, site that was left where they occurred produced uh, 26 larvae. They took them all into the lab the way that the condors were all taken in, got them through the winter, but all of the males died before the first female emerged from the chrysalis. So the British large blue became extinct. And uh, that was a great tragedy that was mourned in the Times of London and so on and so forth. Well, they had the habitat back in shape. They just didn't have the butterflies. And so they figured, 
Well, we're running about 10,000 years removed, evolutionarily speaking, from the large blues of the continent. Let's see if we can find a donor population that uh, is similar in its genome and its ecology to the British. And they did so in Sweden, and they took donors from several different sites, learning from what they had done wrong with the large copper. So they wouldn't end up with a, a homozygous, homozygous clone in the uh, in the colony. There was just a management waif, and it worked. It worked so well that now, 20 years later, the large blue is absolutely thriving on a dozen or more habitats in southwest England, and actually starting to move north a little bit with climate change. It's uh, one of the organisms that can be said to be probably so far actually benefiting from the warming climate. So that kind of brings us all the way around. And that got me to thinking, Michael, what if we were able to practice some sort of a similar caper with the Xerxes blue? I wrote an essay about that in Wild Earth that I called uh, Resurrection Ecology. Talked about the large blue. I said, what are the possibilities here with the, with the Xerxes blue? And I put that idea out there. And then in subsequent years, the Presidio in San Francisco, the old, old, I mean, colonial times, military reserve, uh, which is where the Xerxes blue had last been known to occur in 1943, came back into public hands, not military hands, but, but uh, park hands, and a lot of the habitat at the Presidio was restored. So once again, there um, is suitable habitat there. And the deer, we, the same the same lotus that the Palos Verdes blue uses, I believe. Hmm is now coming back as well. And so the habitat is roughly appropriate for Xerxes again. It's just that the Xerxes blue is extinct. Well, there is debate among a modern lepidopter geneticists as to whether the Xerxes blue was a fully distinct species or possibly a, a subspecies of the silvery blue, but certainly as Palos Verdes blue is. Rauchasyche ligdomus Palos Verdesensis Fairly co closely related to Xerxes, and and so it certainly seems that Xerxes and the uh, silvery blue have at least a common ancestor. And um, so we looked and looked, and I just had lunch last week here in Astoria with one of the lepidopterists now who's going to work on that project that came out of my essay. And they're working with two major uh, genetic laboratories, as well as a team of ecologists, and they have identified a population of silvery blues um, down near the... Marina Dunes, where there is another endangered blue called the Smith's Blue, and um, and the silvery blues are doing well there on the lotus, and so they're now looking at the distinct possibility of reintroducing that population to the Presidio and seeing if over time microevolution doesn't tend to bring them back toward the San Francisco type, uh, which was Xerxes, which was extremely distinctive in its appearance with big white eye spots beneath. You know, that was just a shot in the dark for me to write that resurrection ecology essay. And that's the very exciting thing, Michael, about being a writer, is when you write something and it actually affects other things, other people, other ways of being. I mean, I've got a, right now, one of my books called Where Bigfoot Walks has been adapted and made into a feature film that's shown in over 100 theaters already this month around the country, as well as drive-ins and it's starting to stream. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. That's a great I watched heck it. Yeah, I watched it a few weeks back. Have you seen it? Yeah, of course. I heard that your book came out. The new book, again, congratulations on Nature Matrix coming out. We're going to bring the talk around to that since that's what yeah. we're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Bob Pyle. I will provide a link to his essay, Resurrection Ecology, in the show notes and show description. So you can go to it right now if you're listening and click on it and be able to read it. That article was published in Wild Earth. This journal was one of a few Earth-first movement writings. The environmentalist group that was founded two decades before Bob's essay on the idea that every life form and ecosystem has a right to live and flourish regardless of human interests. In this essay, he nominated the experimental reconstitution of the extinct Xerxes Blue from the nearest surviving genotypes since its last known habitat around the Presidio had been recently transferred to the National Park Service after 150 years of occupation by the United States Army. Of the 1,500 acres in the park now, 
From what I can tell, a scant 140-ish acres are dedicated to habitat of native plant communities. So really just a postage stamp size area that is blue butterfly approved. In looking at the etymology of the term resurrection, which is a noun, circa 1300, originally the name of a church festival commemorating Christ rising from death. Noun of action from past participle stem of Latin resurgere, rise again, appear again, in Middle English sometimes translated as again rising. So in Bob's article, which I encourage you to read, he says, contrary to popular conservation aphorism, extinction may not always have to be forever. Occasionally, the thoughtful reintroduction of an organism closely related to an extinct type can result in a functional reconstruction of the animal or plant thought to be lost in toto. The conditions permitting such a Lazarus act are rare, and their employment raises all sorts of philosophical questions. Still, reestablishment of near relatives in restored habitats may be an act worth considering in some cases. I would like to nominate the Xerces Blue as a candidate for such radical reconstitution. So I would encourage most folks looking at this sort of activity to move at the speed of trust. In Bob's essay, he notes that this sort of action raises quote-unquote philosophical questions. I find that the assisted migration debate is steeped in technology of Western science, but what is most worth our attention are the ethical implications of moving species around the landscape. So a resource I am grateful to have is Culturally Competent Approaches in Conservation Biology, which streamed live on October 23rd of 2020. So I'm so grateful that the Fish 513 Fall Seminar from the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences has been publicly available to stream on Friday afternoons and otherwise found on YouTube and known as Current Topics in Management, Conservation, and Restoration, colon, Cultivating Inclusive Conservation Practices. This October 23rd edition was led by Tara Chestnut, Netsy Bullchild, and Brad Beach, where they talked about their collaborative work to in- reintroduce the fisher to Mount Rainier National Park while acknowledging the United States history of racially unjust practices with regards to indigenous groups. And it really highlights the indigenous removals and the issues that current peoples have with moving species or individuals and its similarities to the United States policy of removal of whole communities or young people during the boarding school era. It's a pretty deep topic. It's probably worth its own episode. I can't really do much of it justice right here. Or it's really worth your time to deliberate on if you're considering assisted migration as a strategy to mitigate climate disruption. So I'll leave you with a few words from Bob thinking that in the year 2000, he said, resurrection ecology will never reverse the majority of human-mediated extinctions, nor will community-based restoration efforts reverse disastrous global trends that will ultimately undo all of our best efforts without adequate address. Kind of a big bummer, pretty standard for (laughs) Earth-first. In some ways, I am hopeful that this is not true, that community-based restoration efforts really provide some sort of solution that is futuristic and an inclination towards what is possible post-capitalism. Flash forward to 2020, I would agree that this sort of activity is not going to be the end-all be-all of reversing extinction. In this vein, I recall what Sally Aiken said earlier this year about the challenge of environmental change and climate disruption. In that episode, she discussed moving tree genotypes or entire species to more northern latitudes to preemptively create climate-ready niches for trees in a warming world. 20 years ago, I don't think a decade on ecosystem restoration was on the horizon for us either. But right now, we are on the precipice of the biggest worldwide investment into restoration efforts ever. In the paraphrased words of my newest favorite author, Adrian Marie Brown, We are currently living in the reality of someone else's dreams. We are in an imagination battle. Our radical imagination is a tool for decolonization, for reclaiming our right to shape our lived reality. 
Before I leave you today, I just want to tell you about some news coming up. On January 28th of 2021, I'm going to be facilitating a little webinar on my favorite species other than people called the Pacific Madrone. The title of that talk is going to be Pacific Madrone, Sacred, Emergent, and Adaptive. I'm going to talk about my interspecies love story with the tree. I want to explore the complex interactions and patterns that arise in madrone forests that harbor biodiversity below ground and in the canopy. Importantly, I also want to highlight the adaptive capacity and resiliency of the species amidst climate disruption. I want to thank Tacoma Tree Foundation for making space to highlight the relationship we have with madrone and building the skills required to help ensure we have a future for the species. The foundation is com- improving community health and well-being through social inclusion, cohesion, and capital building to restore urban trees and green spaces in the greater Tacoma area, Pierce County, and watersheds of the Salish Sea. I'll put a link to that event in the show description and the show notes. I think I'm going to postpone future portions of the Robert Michael Pyle conversation because I would like to introduce you all next to Dr. Nicole Redvers, who is a naturopathic doctor at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Redvers was the first licensed practicing naturopathic doctor in North America who is Dene, a member of the Dene Nuque First Nation Band. After growing up in Canada's isolated north, she pursued an advanced Western medical education and has traveled the globe, studying traditional medicine systems in various countries and working with indigenous patients. She is adept at bridging the gap between traditional and modern medical systems. Dr. Redvers published The Science of the Sacred, Bridging Global Indigenous Medicine Systems and Modern Scientific Principles in 2019. And in 2020, She co-authored exquisite articles on molecular decolonization and indigenous natural and first law in planetary health articles. Here's an excerpt from our conversation. Land-based healing is planetary healing and planetary healing is land-based healing. They're interconnected completely. So yes, I do believe that there's strong indications and sometimes the data is there. It's just not termed in the way that people might be looking for. (laughs) Land-based healing has a lot of data surrounding its benefit, providing protective factors that have been identified in the literature for Indigenous well-being, in other words, and then, of course, the nature connectedness literature, which has been very clear in terms of the benefits to people on what happens when we can reestablish those relationships. I'm Michael Yadrick, and this has been another episode of Tree Hugger Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the show so we show up in your feed. I don't want to fall off your radar. It would be cool if you can drop a short review of the show, too. It will help other people find it. Then, of course, you all can keep up to date with the show on Instagram and Twitter at Tree Hugger Pod. Please feel free to email me comments, questions, and ideas at treehuggerpod at gmail.com. As for Robert Michael Pyle, one more thing to add to his resume. The intro music was from Man Turns Into Cloud from the 2019 release Butterfly Launches from Sparpole. Bob performs spoken word and harmonica on the album, while Chris Novoselic and Ray Prestigard play bass, accordion, dobro, violin, etc. The album was produced by Jack Andino. Andino is a well-known producer and musician based in Seattle associated with Seattle label Sub Pop. Indino worked on influential grunge albums from the local bands, including Mud Honey, Soundgarden, and Nirvana. We will talk more about Bob's music in future parts of our conversation. I leave you with another tune from that album. Thanks for listening. I will see you in the reflection of Butterfly Wings. At the top of the forest that used to be, a spar pole stands that makes logs fly as they never could before, just rooted in the ground. Spar poles once were trees themselves. One tall, straight fir could lord it over all the other trees in the wood until the others were all gone. The high climber made spar poles, climbed the tallest tree, bucking limbs as he went. 200 feet straight up, 
and then he topped the tree, leaned against his belt at the top of the world, took in the view, hoping the belt wouldn't slip, hoping the trees would last forever. Now, the tall tree's all gone. Sparkles are towers of steel, and the second grove dances to diesel instead of steam. High riggers drop leads from the sky. Choker setters fix cables to logs. And then, if the chokers hold, the trees get to fly all the way up to the landing. Now that pole on the horizon, the beeps and the whistle bug, the saws and the fallers, they're all signs that the trees are still flying off the land. And then, all of a sudden, a butterfly floats over the show, looking for a place to light. A flower, a meadow, maybe a tree. But what's this? Far above the stumps below, a shiny cap on a shiny tree that has cables for branches. As good a place as any, she thinks, to bask, to rest, to take in the view. The rigger sees her land. He thinks it's a spark in the hot high leaves. Hope they don't shut us down, he says, or put us on hoot owl this damn early. Well, people and jobs fly off the hills, too, as more machines move in, as trees run out. But all that flies away, they say, comes back around in the end. And that butterfly launching from the spar pole? Why, that's just a promise that the land lives on, that the trees still grow, that the forest will be back one day, no matter what.